Hello and welcome to the next session. We're going to give everyone a minute to get in here and we will get started again. We are in the second year of doing a virtual conference and we're in the second session of this conference. Um, so thanks so much for being here. We're excited to be here. You have just entered the at home seed processing question and answer session. Um, hopefully you had a chance to watch the at home seed processing video already. Uh, we're not actually gonna show that um, video here in this session, um, but if you haven't had a chance, that's okay. Um, bring your questions anyway, and uh, we recommend watching that video whenever you have a chance. Uh, my name is Janine Shepard. I'm the Education and Engagement Manager here at Seed Savers. Uh, you've probably all been receiving emails from me, so hello. Thanks for being here. Um, and joining us for this session is Cody Egan and Rochelle Wiedenhaft. They are the Seed Savers field managers here. So they are overseeing uh, a lot of the work that's going into both growing these seeds and processing them once they're harvested. So these are two great people to be answering questions about your own at home seed saving processes. Um, and we're excited to have them here. So Cody and Rochelle, thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to start with kind of a basic question, um, and maybe it's an in-depth question, but a question for people who are just getting started seed saving. Um, what would you recommend as, ba as basic tools um, to start off with on a seed saving journey? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, can I just start by saying like, thank you for calling us experts, but we're all learning <laughs> on this path of life. Uh, and of seed keeping. So Rochelle and I will do our best. I don't think either of us would call ourselves experts. Again, thank you, Janine. But uh, <laughs> um, hmm, I'm going to, I'm just going to throw out. Okay. Because I need to ruminate. <laughs> that I'm Rochelle and this is Cody. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm excited to talk about seed processing because it's one of my favorite times of the year. I may be my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, basic toolkits for seed processing um, are less tangible than you might expect. <laughs> um, for me, like I think that uh, pr your your problem solving brain, helmet, hat, um, and intuition, and <laughs> um, uh, and just like knowing what your goals are mm -hmm. um, and not trying to like do something exactly the way that somebody else is doing it necessarily because their goals might be really different. And so just keeping in mind that like, well, I don't maybe need the germination rate to be super high because I'm just gonna plant it in my garden next year. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm giving seeds out to other people, um, then that might mean that I want to have a higher germination rate and a little bit cleaner seed just so that it's, you know, better and more respectful of what you're, what you're giving to them. Um, and yeah, so those are kind of the intangibles mm -hmm. that I think are really important. Yeah. Um, and really knowing what your goals are can help inform what specific tools you want to use. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we kind of think of the tenants of seed um, we want it to be dry, we want it to be stored in an airtight container, and we want it to be in a cool place. That's kind of like the finished product. So like, how do you get to those steps? Um, so really, our world revolves around fans a lot of time. <laughs> That's kind of like the, you know, if we could get a fan sponsorship, I would wear a, a fan I on a t-shirt. Um, so important, good <laughs> airflow for both those wet seeded and those dry seeded crops is so important. If you don't dry them out quickly and thoroughly, bad news bears coming along, um, you're going to run into mold issues and just poor storage quality. Um, so like if you're looking to make one investment, like a fan is pretty important, unless you happen to be in like a very arid, dry climate. Uh, most of us in the United States don't have the luxury of that. So we have to use fans and dehumidifiers. Um, taking another step back and thinking about, you know, home processing, you can do a lot with, you know, jars. If you're thinking about decanting tomato seeds or fermenting tomato seeds, um, just little sieve screens to wash things clean. Um, I think one of the things we talk about a lot is that you can do a lot with a little, um, really not 
overextending your resources or um, yourself, you know, like be realistic about what you want to accomplish. Like Rochelle said, what are your goals and how do you get there without taking the passion out of seed work and without mm -hmm. strapping yourself financially? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So like for, for a tangible example of that, um, we use a lot of different types and shapes of seed screens, um, and window seed, screens. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> seed screens, you can get, um, you know, some really expensive ones that nestle inside of each other. And there's like tons and tons of sizes of holes. Um, but you don't need that. Mm -hmm. Um, you probably don't need that. You might, but you probably don't. Um, if you're if you're saving seed from like uh, two crops, then you probably only need like two or three, maybe mm -hmm. four different sizes of screens, and you can make them with things you have lying around, maybe. So depending on the size of the seeds that you're working with, um, you can. There's lots of different, you know, kitchen sieves mm -hmm. and and you know noodle screening colanders. things colanders that's the right word <laughs> um, <Noodle screens. laughs> so like you can shop around go to thrift stores stores whatever and find um colanders that are you know this size that you need yeah. to just get that chaff away from the um the seed yeah and kind of in the vein of this whole conference you know thinking about your local community um mm -hmm. there are a lot of farmers who have old clippers and maybe they clean a soybean crop that they just produce on site every year and that's the only time they use that clipper and maybe you're growing a giant population of corn and you don't want to winnow that by hand um really thinking about expanding your network um and even just you know if you have a good rapport with a neighbor or a friend just being like can i look at your sieves <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> can i look at your kitchen yeah, calendar i just need to know what you have what size you have yeah. Um, so really thinking about your local community, seed hubs, um, different farmers that have screens and resources or different seed organizations that might be willing or able to spare, you know, a couple of screens or maybe run your little lot that you really want to have really high germ through a machine that they can, you know, winnow it really effectively, really quickly. Um, I think that the building networks and community mm -hmm. around seed is such a powerful thing. And I think we often forget that when we think about home seed processing where it feels very insular and you're like, I'm doing this for myself, but it still can be community based. Um, you can still look outside of the little silo of your home um, while you think about producing for yourself or for your greater region or your home seed library that's in your front yard. Yeah, I love that. Um, Rochelle, you said that seed processing season is your favorite season. What is seed processing season? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, for us, because we're growing so many different varieties, we, we end up kind of having this uh, really concentrated time that we're pretty much only processing seed. So um, for fleshy crops, once we start harvesting, we're processing. So with our tomatoes and, and peppers and eggplants and cucumbers and squash and things like that, we are doing that, um, that seed extraction from the fruit, the fermenting, the decanting um, in, you know, like mid-August all the way through frost time. Um, and all of our dry harvested crops, we start we start threshing beans usually in September. And um, since we are going back to goals, so the goals that Cody and I have for seed processing are pretty like we want a high germ and we want <laughs> we want like really all the chaff to be out of all of the lots of seeds. Um, and so November, December, we we end up working with um, <clears throat> a couple different machines that we have that can get that really refined tuning on um, cleaning the seed and making sure the germination rates are high. Mm -hmm. And I would just throw in um, talking about goals and expectations and fleshy processing. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of call that our P1 stage, you know, the processing number one, um, extracting the seeds from the fruit. And with a lot of those crops, cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers, you have a really great opportunity to do a lot of your kind of P2ing, the second round of processing in that moment. Um, so if you think about 
a tomato harvest, maybe at home you're growing 10 tomato plants and you really want that first fruit, you know, early maturing, that's what you're selecting on. So maybe you have, you know, like five tomatoes from each plant, that's 50 tomatoes. That's going to be a lot of seed. Um, unless you are ambitious and really planning on growing out hundreds to thousands of <laughs> tomato plants, maybe you need a couple hundred seeds to really carry along those genetics. So you have an opportunity right there after you ferment, when you're starting to decant to just say like, I can pour off a lot of seeds and still have a lot of seeds. And that really makes your life in the later fall a lot easier because you already know that you did a pretty good selection for heavy mature seeds. Mm -hmm. um, so I think of that um, at home scale, also thinking about like, what are your goals? What's your end result? What do you want it to be? And how do you make that process easier for yourself? Um, in the kind of seed community around here, like Rochelle said, we're trying to balance like maximum seed yield with highest germ with lowest amount of chaff. And mm -hmm. so we really have to zero that in. But at home, you don't need to have all of those different elements kind of become a balance. Yeah, know? it might not matter that you that you are saving the most amount of seeds mm -hmm. possible. So Cody's example is really exciting. Like you can, you can really pour off all the seeds that are kind of floating mm -hmm. and say, okay, it might germinate, but it's not as like heavy and full and mature as the ones that are really sinking down to the bottom totally. of the jar when you're decanting. So, and this brings up another really great point that Rochelle and I always talk about is just really documenting mm -hmm. what you're doing in your garden, documenting yeah. those seeds. Um, for example, that tomato, that theoretical tomato we're talking about, <laughs> you know, you're doing selection work as you harvest. So whether it be mm -hmm. for early maturing, vigor, sweetness, flavor, yield, um, those are all things that you can, you know, write down on a little slip of paper and put with those seeds and carry forward. Um, I know that I did this selection work for the earliest maturing tomatoes or uh, the opposite side, like this plant was still looking healthy after all the others got late blight. Mm -hmm. um, really, it's difficult to remember to slow down and take notes during the summer it is difficult for us who do this as a profession. <laughs> um, but just making sure you, you know, don't, don't trust your memory. Yeah. You <laughs> won't remember next year. And also like next year, if you remember that, I know I selected for something yeah. <laughs> and, and it's easier to carry that through from generation to generation and continue that selection. Mm -hmm. If you're really trying to get an early maturing pepper, um, if you have it written down. Yeah. <laughs> and that also just ties in so nicely with, you know, regionally adapted, even if it's adapted to the tiny little microclimate of your yard mm -hmm. or the small town you live in or the big town you live in, um, really thinking about tomato or, you know, varieties that are adapted and continuing to adapt to the climate that you want to grow them in. It just makes everyone, including yourself, so much happier. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a follow-up question from uh, Marl. Um, saying so aside from tools and mindsets what plant or plants do you recommend to start with for someone who wants to learn seed saving oh yeah that's always such a fun question i mean <laughs> i i think the easy go-to is just like find a beautiful bean that speaks to you um someone that just you know maybe it's a tan bean maybe it's modeled maybe it's a runner bean um beans are just such reliable producers they're pretty pretty tolerant of a lot of conditions. Um, and I would venture to say there's not much more, not many things that are more magical than shelling those really beautiful beans that you've produced yourself. And you just have that moment of remembering the spring, remembering the whole summer, remembering the harvests, mm -hmm. remembering the moment that you shelled them. Um, so beans, beans are fun. Beans are showy. They're so lovely. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. Um, I think also, I mean, in in terms of somebody who's been growing um, and isn't new to that, but has not done seed saving, um, I I also like to recommend saving from tomatoes, just because um, that is, I mean. Oh, you know, most people like tomatoes. And so that's another thing where you can just like be really excited about harvesting this big, beautiful fruit um, or maybe small cherry tomatoes. Um, 
And what I like about tomato seed processing and seed saving is that there is kind of that extra step, but it's like kind of this beautiful magical thing where you just leave it on the counter and the <laughs> you know the, the environment the microbes in that are just in your air that you don't know about like do the magical fermentation um and 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 then you get to um I don't know just like rinsing seeds I really like doing it it's sort of silly thing but um poor you know the decanting just always <laughs> makes me like think about high school chemistry and <laughs> I guess that's a good memory but um yeah I just I think that uh tomato seed processing even though it's not as basic and like mm -hmm. really easy as bean processing it gives you kind of ability to dip your toe into something that's a little bit more complicated. Yeah. And I do want to just harp on this point. Um, this work is passion fueled mm -hmm. and, you know, it's just so important, especially if you're starting out seed keeping, pick something that does speak to you, yeah. that intrigues you, that gives you, you know, love and pleasure and will you know, make you smile when you're working with it. It shouldn't be a chore. You know, I think it's really important that we um, appreciate the work we're doing and not get into this mindset of like, oh, now I have to go harvest the tomatoes to squeeze. If you don't love tomatoes, don't grow them or don't grow them for seed or grow them for seed, but also supplement it with yeah. something you really love um, and just make sure, make sure you keep the pleasure, the enjoyment, the love in seed keeping that to me is so important to remember. Yeah. And like, it's really easy for us and, and other people to recommend like beans, tomatoes, and lettuce are super easy yeah. <laughs> seed saving to start with. But like, if those crops aren't meaningful to you, then, um, like, uh, yeah, what's the point? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, really, what's the point? So like, don't want to grow food crops and you yeah. want to grow cosmos you know yeah. like it doesn't I think we also need to remember that there's like beauty in the ornamental world mm -hmm. in flowers and how they add to the garden farm landscape um so really I think we're trying to say don't like reduce yourself to what we're trying to tell you to do <laughs> pick what brings you joy and if it goes well amazing if it doesn't try again or mm -hmm. reach out and we'll try to help you <laughs> yeah thank you um, I have a question from Mackenzie. Uh, Mackenzie is saying, if it happens to rain when a dry seed plant is ready to harvest, how many days should one wait for the plant to dry out before harvesting the seed? Ooh, that's a great question. Yeah, that is a great that's question. That's like so nitty gritty. I love it. I love it. <laughs> it, it depends. So everything depends. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I would say that it depends on um, the, you know, the climate after it rains. Mm -hmm. So after it rains, if it's like really foggy and musty and <laughs> like humid yeah. <laughs> for a bunch of days, that's not going to help you. Mm -hmm. Um, and if it rains and then it's really dry, then, you know, probably it's going to dry up gonna be fine. pretty quick. Um, it, uh, let's see, I'll just give a example of, um, a barley that I did a partial harvest last week. And then this week it rained like two inches a couple of days ago. And then now it's like pretty foggy and not, you know, super dry out. Um, and I was just talking to one of um, uh, my crew members, Robin, and we we're just talking about like, well, should we harvest the barley next week? It's going to be a dry week next week. And I said, it just, you know, it depends on if the barley is still, is it dry from the rain? Um, if it's, if it's not drying down after that rain, then bring it in because you can, you can get fans on it mm -hmm. and hopefully you have fans, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it's easier to dry it down in kind of that, that space that we've created um, if it's not drying down in the field, so. And to some extent, um, I also think about the stage the plant is in. Yeah. Um, if you're maybe towards the end of the season, you know, the plant is maybe already suffering from some issues shall we say uh go ahead and harvest you know if it's really early maybe it's the very first pod and you know maybe there's like a little bit of disease that you're seeing but you're not sure you know there's something funky happening at the bottom 
water is a very good vector for all sorts of issues in our garden spaces. Um, so in that case, like to maintain the health of the plant, maybe you say, I'm not gonna worry about that one pod that's ready. I'm gonna hope that I don't infect the rest of the plant by spreading disease throughout. Um, so it's kind of taking a step back and thinking like more holistically than just like, I need those seeds. It's how do I look at the seeds, the weather, the plant health, again, my goals, like, do you want mm -hmm. every single seed that's on the plant or do you want, you know, just enough to grow next year, or maybe to share with your neighbor or your friend. Um, so really the intentions kind of can help inform the decisions you make. And I know in this question, the theoretical is that it's already rained, mm -hmm. but just to take it a step back in a, in a different direction that if you know it's going to rain um, and your, your dry crop is not maybe fully mature and it's not like fully ready to be harvested but it is going to rain and you maybe think it's going to be like wet for a whole bunch of days after then um think about taking it in early so that's the mm -hmm. same thing like if birds are taking out your crop like bring it in early and um for the most part the seeds are you know maybe didn't get all of the maturity from the plants that it could have, but they're still probably going to be viable if it's pretty close to um, fully mature. And um, for some crops, like, um, you know, you can take in more of the plant and like not just the pods, pea. like a bush pea. You can take the whole plant. In. Yeah, great example. You can We're take the whole that. plant in. Yeah, we have some bush peas that are just harvested. Um, and the seeds will like imbibe just a little bit more energy from the plant because it's all connected instead of just taking those pods. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, I have a question here asking if the fingernail test is appropriate for all seeds. Um, no. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> if you expand the fingernail test to uh, teeth, hammers, uh exacto knives mm -hmm. um <laughs> then sure yeah <laughs> uh what we do a lot is just like cutting open seeds so mm -hmm. even seeds that are um like tomato seeds are really small you can't like try to you can't snap the tomato seed you can't scratch the tomato seed you can't really so those small seeds we often cut in half and then you can um check out to see how the embryo mm -hmm. is on the inside if it's full if it's nice and white um yeah I yeah. think of like the fingernail test as a tool in your toolbox of seed maturity assessment yeah um and so there are all the other factors you know like what did the pod look like what does the seed coat look like beyond just whether or not you can scratch it um like Rochelle said what does the embryo look like what does it feel like when you cut it in half or when you bite it in half is there um, a snap yeah when you if when you, you like have a little pepper or, or a tomato it? yeah so all of those are going to help inform um seed maturity embryo maturity um we talk about the fingernail test a lot because you can do it to a bean and not have harvested a whole tomato you know like once the tomato's harvested that ship has sailed but yeah. theoretically with beans you know you can pick one scratch it hope it's still very soft let's let the rest of them ride for a couple more weeks um but again, I just want to highlight that, you know, it's one tool in a tool chest to assess, like, should I harvest? Is this ready? And it also, um, it's kind of indicate, it's like an, an idealized version of assessment. Cause I think a lot of times the practical reality in gardens and on farms is that you do have a rain event or a frost coming and yeah. it doesn't necessarily matter if it passes the fingernail test or not, you still have to pull it in and dry it down, get those fans on it, try to do what you can. Um, so I just want to kind of, you know, asterisk that and say fingernail, if you, if you get there and everything's great, that's awesome. But sometimes it won't pass the fingernail test and you'll still have to harvest anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Liz is asking, do you have issues with weevils feeding on immature seeds in brassica pods while you're waiting for the pods to mature? 
We do not. We are pretty lucky in the Midwest. We have very few weevils. Um, the only one that comes to mind that we've dealt with on site is the hollyhock weevil. Um, but we don't really have bean or brassica weevils like they do down in the south. Um, I think that's another example of like, get the pods as far along as you can and then harvest them, dry them and freeze them. Um, if the weevils are eating all of your seeds, it's not going to matter if you let it go the whole time to be like crispy, hard seed coat, fully mature. Um, that's another one of like seed keeping is very much reacting in a lot of ways to the conditions and trying to do your best to work with the plants and the environment to get finished beautiful seed. And sometimes that is not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> And can you talk a little bit more? You said dry them and freeze them. How do you know if they're dry enough to freeze? That's a great question. <laughs> um, so a lot of times you can do, um, well, I'll, I'll take a step back and say at Seed Savers, we have a very fancy, fun uh, moisture content reader. Obviously, most people don't have that. So that's, again, when you're going to use that toolbox of you know, assessment. So if it's, um, what's something that we'd have to work? Uh, what did we get in like a well we'll go with the hollyhock you know like you're gonna dry it down um the hollyhock seeds are those little coins you're gonna try to break it like how does that seed break is it rubbery is it really malleable it doesn't have a clean snap um that's gonna be too wet you know you just kind of can intuit that if generally if it yeah. doesn't snap when you bend it or cut it with a knife too then it's too wet yep. to be in the freezer and so really uh, the goal and this is a little bit of a in the weeds answer because we're talking specifically about weevils where you know it's kind of like harvest dry and freeze as quickly as possible yeah. um if it was just a crop that you were didn't have weevil concerns you know just let it dry as long as you can but weevils you want to freeze them out so they don't continue to drill into your seeds um so really it's again kind of intuiting and then examining the seed. Like if you continue to see really extensive damage in your seed, you know, it's probably worth the risk of freezing it a little early mm -hmm. um, just to stop that, that damage before you lose all of your seeds. Yeah. yeah with immature brassica seeds, that would, I'm, I'm not sure you might dry it for a little while and then freeze it. Um, but yeah, generally mm -hmm. with weevils, we like harvest it, it when freezer. it's dry and get it to the freezer as soon. So if the seeds are immature, that dry down isn't going to work in that same way. Yeah. So um, I don't have a great answer. There's a little bit of like threading a needle there. Yeah. <laughs> Another kind of follow up question about harvesting seeds and the, the maturity, the state of maturity. Can you harvest seeds that are not yet fully mature and still have them? mature after harvest and be viable? Yeah, um, I think the cleanest example would be cucurbits, which really benefit from a post-harvest ripening. Um, and we'll talk specifically about squash because you know we kind of think of them as ready to eat when the seeds are ready. Um, so you could harvest the seeds that moment, you know, like the day you harvest, you scoop them out, you dry them off, you call it good. But if you're able to let those seeds continue to mature, continue to pull nutrients and, you know, that beautiful life force from the squash while it sits in storage, you really see an increase in germination and in vigor. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just like a really clean example. There are definitely others where, you know, you're still pulling some moisture, you know, the umbilical hasn't severed like a brassica, like mm -hmm. if you can grab that whole stalk or the whole plant and mm -hmm. dry it as a, a unit you're really going to be able to have a better end product. Um, but also they're probably going to be slightly less vigorous. Maybe you'll have to like really think about babying them a little bit. And again, that's like another take a note, put that note with the seeds mm -hmm. so that you know how to treat those seeds in the future. Mm -hmm. Like maybe just scribbling a little note that was like harvested early, quadruple so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that, I mean, that brings me to something I haven't said yet, but it's like so much a part of this is that um, seed maturity, harvest readiness, and also processing is v extremely crop specific. So mm -hmm. um, even just this question is going to be really 
crop specific yeah. <laughs> like how much does brassica seed like after ripen if you harvest the pods a little earlier i don't know exactly for sure because everything is just like so crop specific mm -hmm. so that's again why your notes and just learning year after year on the variety that you're working with on the crop that you're working with is um just like your experience is invaluable mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um, I'm going to change directions a little bit from seed um, maturity. And I also just want to pause for a minute to say we probably won't get to all of the questions today. You guys have great questions. Um, yeah. <laughs> and this, is, this, is, this is fantastic. So thank you. Um, I do want to point you towards the Community Seed Network um, and towards the Seed Savers Educational Resources. We do have a lot of things on both of those sites. Um, and I think Catherine's going to put those um, in the chat here, links to those two uh, sites in the chat for your reference as well. So just wanted to take a second to say that. Keep the questions coming, but if we don't get to it, um, there are some resources as well. Um, so changing directions a little bit to talk about isolation. Uh, Sarah is asking, in a small garden space, what other barriers um, could, could you provide, uh, sorry, barriers such as a trellis crop? I'm not sure if I'm reading that correctly, but can you talk a little bit about um, barriers you can put in place in a small garden space? Yeah, um, you're always going to be fighting cross-pollination. So in your garden, if you're growing two Oleraceae brassicas, um, there's going to be that natural desire for cross-pollination. Um, there's not really a great way to avoid that. There is, you know, some research on distraction crops. So that would be, you know, like trying to plant a butt ton of flowers that are all flowering at the same time as both mm -hmm. of those brassicas, mm -hmm. just to kind of, you know, make a, a, a flower barrier. Yeah. <laughs> um, could you feel 100% confident that there was no crossing in that space? No. Um, but again, I, I guess I'll pull this back to a refrain we seem to be hitting a lot in this session. Um, what are your intentions? You know, <laughs> if you are growing two cabbages, you love both of those cabbages, you stewarded both of them through a winter and they're both flowering. Um, are you okay if they cross pollinate? You know, Does like really maybe, yeah, like maybe you're gonna end up <laughs> with a new variety um, and maybe it's gonna be the new awesome cabbage that everyone <laughs> loves. Um, obviously, I will now say if you're doing something that's a little bit more rigorous, like a, uh, like a Renew Grow, uh, Nora Hummel, talking about Nora a lot, we'll be plugging this later. Um, if you're growing something that you really want that clean ISO on, I think the, the only way to be sure you're not gonna have a cross contamination is just to pick one crop and don't let the others flower. One and crop it, of that species, yep, yeah. It really hurts your heart. I battled that in my garden all the time, just being like, I'm so sorry, you gotta go, you gotta go. Um, but for that genetic purity, that preservation of a variety, um, those are, Kind of the the burdens we have to shoulder as seed keepers from time to time um and i think that's another one where you know just like getting to know your plants a little and just mm -hmm. you know having that respectful reciprocal relationship where you say thank you very much i don't need your seeds <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah and also just like a, a sense of um like that is something you have to do to care for the seeds mm -hmm. that you are trying to get that variety. And it's very much um, in the vein of like variety maintenance too. Yeah. Like as much as we, again, kind of feel that pain of saying like, I'm sorry, you're a runty plant, you're out of here. You know, we really want to be selecting on traits that are desirable. Um, and thinking about like that variety more like in the course of time mm -hmm. right so we're we're wanting that variety to be strong and rigorous and like yeah continue to continue be continue to be <laughs> itself <laughs> yeah. with the caveat yeah. that we just plugged like let them cross it'll be fun another <laughs> experimentation thing, yeah another thing that is dependent uh, back to your question of um is like what what are the ways that that crop that you're working with um, pollinates? Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about um, a brassica, in Cody's example, those crops are very 
um, outcrossing. So they they need, in fact, to swap pollen and genetics with each other. But if we're talking about two tomato varieties, then it's like way more likely that having that that um, flower buffer is going to do the trick mm -hmm. um, because they are just less likely to be sharing pollen with each other. And so the way that pollinators work, you know, they like go to sections of the same flower. And so they're going to like hang out on all the tomato flowers. And then, and then if they get distracted by the buckwheat flower, for example, like then they're going to hang out on the buckwheat flower and then maybe make their way over to the other tomato flower. Um, and yeah, so the tomatoes are just way less likely to totally. be crossing. And in those situations too, um, you know, physical barriers are fairly effective at times. Again, it, it depends on that pollination mechanism, how likely they are to outcross. But um, if you're kind of like, ooh, I don't have directly the maximum isolation distance between these two tomatoes, but I can put one on one side of my garage and one on the other, like using There's those, like building yeah, too, yeah, using those um, kind of permanent structures and planning your garden space um, around them in that way to kind of work. It's, we do this a lot at Heritage Farm, just working with nature and the natural topography of our mm -hmm. land to create little micro ISO zones. Mm -hmm. um, and just thinking about like, what's the likelihood that this bee is going to travel from this point to this point if there's this, this, and this in between. And still have like that pollen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Um, moving on to some questions about fermentation. We have a question here that's saying, um, when you're washing your fermented seeds, is it okay to use chlorinated city water or will the chlorine damage them? Hmm. I don't have a clean answer for that because yeah. I don't really know. <laughs> um, we do. Uh, we use water that has chlorine yeah. in it. So. <laughs> yeah. It, there you go. I don't know. I've never thought about that. Yeah. But, I mean, I um, would not go out and buy special water for yeah. my fermentation. Um, if you're worried about still being able to build up like that colony of bacteria and funguses, like don't worry about it. It's going to, the tomato, like if you are really having trouble, um, it's really great to just add a little bit more pulp to it. You know, think of, or throw some dirt in it. Yeah. Like how do you colonize, um, with bacteria that fermentation jar? Um, and usually, you know, our houses, our outdoor spaces are just so full of spores and bacteria that there's not a question of, uh, needing to, insert ourselves into that process at all. So yeah. Um, yeah, give them something to munch on, give them some time, they'll be fine. Right, um, follow-up question about fermentation. Where do you recommend letting these seeds sit for four days if, you're, if you need to let them ferment and they get all fermenty? Yeah, <laughs> I just let them hang on my kitchen counter. Yeah. <laughs> but we're weird like that, you know, it's, um, someplace that you're not going to forget about them. You do run the risk, you know, if out of sight, out of mind. Seeds have been known at Seed Savers to sprout. You know, they'll put out their little radical and we'll be like, well, shucks. Uh, um, so really someplace that you're comfortable with, if that's not on your kitchen counter, maybe you have like a little side table in your dining space, someplace that you'll see them. Um, not all tomatoes, not all cucumbers ferment at the same pace or speed. It also depends on your local, you know, bacterial and fungal flora and how they kind of colonize that um, and how quickly they're digesting off that seed coat envelope. Um, so we can say four days, we can say two days, but really it's another one where you got to use your gut and you got to look at them and um, yeah. And it, it depends on temperature too. Oh, so yeah. if, if your house is really cool, you know, top of the fridge, if, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of the same idea of like sourdough or kombucha or whatever, it needs to be kind of in this warm environment. Yeah. Um, and you can, you can put a paper towel, you know, around it with a rubber band or something, if you don't want insects yeah. flying around. Flies. <laughs> um, but Coffee also, filters work yeah, really well. yeah, also um, using clear jars or clear cups. 
um, is really helpful for that monitoring. Like mm -hmm. Cody was saying, it, it could be two days, it could be one day, it could be four days. So monitoring how, if the seeds are sinking, if they're all like at the bottom, that's like, okay, time to decant and rinse those. Um, yeah, so yeah. clear container helps you monitor. Definitely. Great. Um, and then I have a couple final questions here about seed storage. Um, one question is how, in general, how do you deter pests from seeds in short-term storage? Um, talking short-term, meaning one to two years. Um, and I'll go ahead and ask the other question because it's they're going to easily combine, I think, which is, which is the more preferable um, way of storing seeds in envelopes or glass jars or something else? I mean, we would all love to have a thousand glass jars to store our <laughs> seeds in. That's the dream. The reality on the ground, at least for myself as a home seed keeper, is that I don't have the space or the jars to do that. <laughs> um, so I use a lot of Ziplocs. I find that to be really useful because I can put that little, you know, I usually write a short little description, a little info on it, and I can see that as I'm sorting through the next season. Um, cool, dry, dark, um, if you're having very specific problems, um, I would start thinking about the greater environment that you're storing them in. Uh, like if your basement has a dirt floor and you also store your squashes down there, um, that's awesome and amazing, but you know, it is going to attract rodents. I, there's not really a lot of ways of getting around that. Um, so then thinking about like what storage, what can I put it in, uh, old non-functional chest freezer, you know, something that will be in its essence rodent proof. Mm -hmm. um, I think or just like a bin that has locks on it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of pests people are dealing with, but usually like you can get bins that have, um, that are like waterproof too. So they have some foam around it and then locks. Um, yeah. And if you put it in your Ziploc bags first and then in there, totally. I would think that would be. Yeah. And Paper bags are really great for dry down. They're not great for seed storage. Um, yeah, that's that's maybe a, a really key takeaway there is just you want something that will keep the air out, keep the air that's in there in, and to that extent, you know, not provide a delicious smelling seed smell to a little friend that's hanging out in your basement through the winter. Yeah. <laughs> great. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a pleasure to see all of these great questions coming in and to hear from you, Cody and Rochelle. Um, we really appreciate everyone being here and all of the answers you were able to provide. Um, you can see in the comments, uh, Catherine did put some links to some guides and information on our Seed Savers Exchange website. Um, and also the Community Seed Network has lots of different pieces of information that can uh, answer some of your questions as well. So thanks again for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Cody and Rochelle. And we hope to see you all in the next session. Good luck, everyone. Thanks, Save everybody. Your seeds. Have fun.